2nd, 2002, and we're talking to uh, Bob Will. Uh, okay, now, as I explained on the phone or in my emails, I'm going to talk as absolutely little as possible because this is, we're looking for you, not, not me. Uh -huh. um, after we have the tape transcribed, you'll have an opportunity to review the transcription and uh, edit it and whatnot if there are things in there that you said that don't seem to make sense or uh, when we go through the editing process, if, if I have changed a meaning or something, uh, it, it's, that's unintentional and, and so you need to correct that. Uh, this, the transcription comes out sort of James Joycean. It's just you know, a <laughs> stream of consciousness. And uh, so I have to go through and put in punctuation and make real sentences and paragraphs and all that kind of stuff. And, and in doing that, it's, it's possible that I'm going to change your meaning. You know? So you'll have an opportunity to uh, correct anything. Now, the tape itself is part of the, uh, the archive. And uh -huh. you can't change that. Yeah. So uh, the tape is there. And uh, if anyone 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now Incidentally, the tape and the transcript will both be converted to a CD oh, for okay. permanence. I see. Because uh -huh. a videotape uh, has a shelf life of, I don't know, 10, 15 years maybe, uh -huh. depending on how it's cared for. A CD uh, can last for much longer than that, but beyond that, because it's digitized to get onto a CD, if there is some new medium, a more permanent medium, comes on the scene in 10 or 15 years, why the Colorado River Board may well want to convert the CD then to that uh, absolutely permanent, whatever that might be. But because it's digitized, oh, it's there. And then we will give you a copy, after all done, you'll get a copy of the CD. And that will have the videotape on it, like a CD movie, like a, uh, well, yeah, like a DVD. Yeah. And it will also have the uh, uh, the transcript on there that oh. that we okay. eventually agree right. on. So uh, your heirs, uh, you know, 30 years from now, if they wanted to, they could print it out. Uh, they can watch the video. See what the old man looked like. See what huh? he looked like and <laughs> what kind of a guy he was and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, all right. Uh, the whole process uh, probably takes a couple of months. It's just oh, sure. a matter of time. I mean, so no, no green rush on it. So. Uh, so, given that, uh, and, and again, I, I guess I want to tell you that uh, we'll more or less start chronologically, but I don't think we're going to stay there. We're not going to stay chronologically. It's just the way things go. Sure. Uh, you'll remember things and go, oh, geez, by the way, that reminds me. And, go, and that's fine. Uh, and I'll prompt you from time to time to uh, give us a year, like you'll you might say something like, uh, I remember when I was talking with uh, Bruce yes. Babbitt, and, yes. and I'll stop you and say, when, when was that? You know, and, and you also need to treat me like I'm an idiot. Uh, don't, don't presume that, because you're not talking to me. Uh, you're talking to the camera, and you're talking to someone who isn't even born yet. Uh, and so, uh, if you get into start from scratch. Yeah, start from scratch, and uh, if you get into uh, initials and, and acronyms and stuff like that, I may stop you and go, what does that mean? What does that mean now? Yeah. I may know what it means, but I'm going to stop you to get it Okay, answer. fine. Okay? All right. Um, so, given that, uh, why don't we give people a sense of why we're interviewing you? Uh, and, and the reason is your background in, in water and water issues that goes back to the early 1960s, as I recall. So let's talk about that a little bit. All right. Well, I went to work for the Metropolitan Water District immediately after I passed the California Bar and was a freshman attorney on that staff during uh, the three years that I worked in the office in Los Angeles. And in 1963, we had the Arizona versus California decision. And because we'd lost it, we knew that the 
the next level that we were going to have to work on was uh, in Congress. And so the district decided to open its first Washington, D.C. office. And I was uh, one of the candidates and got selected by Al Williams, who was then the PR director, and it was approved by the board. I'll never forget the date, November 22nd of 1963, uh, when I was told <laughs> that I had the job because about an hour later, of course, we heard that JFK had been shot in Dallas. We opened the office on January 1st of 1964, located in the National Press Building in Washington, D.C and immediately started uh, working on the proposals to uh, build the Central Arizona Project, which the Arizonans, of course, had been working on for years and years. The Central Arizona Project dates before World War II, the concepts of it, but the Arizonans had never really gotten around to doing anything concrete on it, until about 1947, and they had a couple of different uh, ideas as to how to build it. Uh, one was to build a dam in the Grand Canyon called Bridge Canyon Dam and build a gravity aqueduct all the way to Phoenix, which involved, as I've read, uh, well over 100 miles of tunnels, so it was very costly. The alternative, of course, was to build a pumping plant at Lake Havasu, <coughs> and uh, then mostly open canal all the way to Phoenix and all the way on to Tucson. Because we lost the most important part of the Arizona versus California litigation was whether Arizona had to account for its Gila River flows into the Colorado as a part of uh, the lower basin, seven and a half million acre feet. Uh, we knew that we were going to be short of water in the lower basin, and at that time, uh, during some times, Metropolitan was already pumping in excess of it's 550,000 acre feet of entitlement uh, within the 4.4 allocation to California. And what year we're talking, 64, 65? We're talking about 1964, yes. The uh, Senator Carl Hayden, who was uh, from Arizona, was pretty aged. By 1964, he had started representing Arizona when it became a state in 1912, had moved over to the Senate from the House sometime during those years, and was the senior member of the Senate, uh, was chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, and was a real power, although he's getting kind of old and doddery. But he immediately introduced a Central Arizona Project construction bill in the Senate in 1963, right after the decision came down, I believe it was in June of 1963. There was no particular action taken on the bill during 1963, and I showed up just about the time that Congress was starting its second session 1964. When I say second session, I mean Congress has, uh, goes in two-year cycles as a first and a second session. And immediately uh, started going around acquainting myself with the members of the California delegation and with our two senators. Or I should say one senator because Claire Engel was our senator at that time, but had had a stroke and was out of commission. Uh, but primarily Tom Keekle, and started to lay the base for my lobbying effort. 
I was not one of the policy gurus. That was primarily Northcutt Ely with advice from the Colorado River Board and from Joe Jensen, who was chairman of the Metropolitan Water District Board. And at that time, uh, Jensen was in complete control of the MWD policy with regard to the Colorado River and the Central Arizona Project. Now, you said that you were starting your lobbying effort to achieve what was uh, w w with respect to the CAP? Yeah. We had pretty well decided, and when I say we, I mean Colorado River Board and its people, that uh, we wanted a priority over deliveries of Central Arizona project to the extent that we would be cut back below 4.4 on the river, which is our uh, allocation based on the Boulder Canyon Project Act as determined by the Supreme Court. There was always a risk that there would be a deficiency in water supplies in the lower basin in times of real drought or something like that. And we wanted Arizona's Central Arizona project, not the balance of the Arizona projects, because there are some in Yuma and the Colorado River Indian Reservation and places like that that uh, we would come first and continue to get our entitlement uh, to the extent that uh, there was uh, water that could be diverted from the Central Arizona Project. So our objective in all of this was California and Nevada get a priority over the Central Arizona Project which was the kid on the block, so to speak, and we felt that we had a, uh, a prior right to their waters. The issue had come before the Supreme Court, and the court had decided on the shortage issue that it was up to the Secretary of Interior and up to Congress to make that determination, and not the court. So it was an open issue as far as the, the legal issues were concerned. Starting to lobby meant, first of all, I just started off getting myself acquainted with our congressional delegation, which I believe at that time was oh, probably about 38 members. And at that time, our whole state delegation was fairly cohesive on California issues. There was not a lot of the divisions that we see today, uh, and they were very sympathetic to trying to protect uh, Southern California as far as its water supply was concerned. What their motives are, who knows, <laughs> to keep our greedy hands out of the northern part of California or because they loved us or their grandmother lived down here or what. So uh, that, that was my initial job. But um, in early 1964, the Senate Interior and Insular Affairs Committee, which is now called the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, held its first hearing on the Central Arizona Project. And this was on a bill that had been introduced by Carl Hayden. California came in and opposed, of course, unless they gave us some kind of a priority. Uh, that was our important first statement uh, in Congress on what our position would be. At that time also, uh, Stuart Udall, who was a Secretary of Interior at the time, had come up with what he calls the Pacific Southwest Water Plan, because he felt that a regional approach to resolving the problems on the Colorado was 
better than just a contest between California and Arizona, and he was trying to come up with a concept that would provide additional water for the Colorado River so we could satisfy everybody's needs and avoid a big fight. That did muddy up the water, no question about it. Uh, there were lots of complaints about that. The original plan, as I recall, Pacific Southwest Water Plan was going to divert water from Northern California to the Colorado River. Well, you can guess that that didn't sit very well with anybody, either Southern or Northern Californians. Um, our team in Washington was led by Mike Ely, Northcutt Ely, a lawyer for the Colorado River Board and was, I believe, an assistant attorney general so that he could speak officially for the state, even though he was in private law practice in Washington. Um, Governor Brown, at that time, also wanted to try and avoid a war if he could. We had some fairly important issues in Congress at that time, completely apart from the Colorado River, Senator Hayden was chairman of the Appropriations Committee. He could mangle those programs if he wanted to, although I will say for Carl Hayden, he never took out after anybody on this. He never retaliated to my knowledge. Threatened a few times, but never did it. Just for the record, we're talking about Governor Edmund G. Pat Brown. Correct, The, the yes. father of the later Governor Brown. Yes. <laughs> Um, the Californians asked Senator Kiko to also introduce the California bill, which included the priority, and also included some of the Pacific Southwest Water Plan concept about looking for additional supplies of water for the Colorado River. In the House, Ms. Johnson of Roseville, California, was chairman of the Subcommittee on Irrigation and Reclamation of the House Interior and Insular Affairs Committee, now called the Resources Committee. And at the request of the Arizona House members, Mo Udall and John Rhodes, held hearings in Phoenix in early uh, 1964. Okay. Before you get too far on that, you mentioned you noted one name, Biz Johnson. Could you spell that first name again for the record? This is kind of like a, a, oh, a trial yeah. transcript here. And we're gonna, his his real his first name, name was Harold T. Johnson. Right. Okay. Roseville, California. Biz apparently was an old family nickname. B i z z. Okay. Good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful guy. Um, things were a little bit more casual in those days, and Ms. Johnson's subcommittee took me along with them to Phoenix for the hearings. We flew into Sky Harbor in Phoenix, and as we were coming down, we saw a massive lake. And it seems that... Uh, all of the lawns around the Sky Harbor Airport were irrigated by flood irrigation. So as we got close to the airport, we couldn't see anything but water, which of course made some of the Californians uh, really kind of take out after their Arizona comrades. Um, but the hearings were kind of classic Arizona, California congressional hearings, uh, dozens of witnesses coming in and talking about how desperate uh, Arizona is and they're losing their groundwater and they need this water from the Colorado. Um, not much else happened in 1964, which was the last year of that Congress. 
and also an election year. And so moving on to 1965, uh, the members of both the Senate and the House from Arizona reintroduced a Central Arizona Project Bill. They included bridge and marble canyon dams, which were two long proposed dams kind of straddling the Grand Canyon. The intent of that was to provide a cash register for the sale of power revenues to try and help pay for the Central Arizona project. They also included uh, their own version of the Pacific Southwest Water Plan, and that's detailed. You can find that in any book. But uh, it was not <clears throat> the, the proposal to take water out of Northern California was going to look farther to find that water. Um, Senator Kekul and our new Senator uh, Murphy uh, introduced a bill in the Senate which included our California 4.4 priority, as we call our, uh, our priority over the Central Arizona Project. Is that George Murphy? Yes, George Murphy. Um, one time an actor, I believe. A tap dancer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they also included their own regional plan, which was more far-reaching and included searching the whole west for other water supplies, which is an important factor in, in later negotiations and on the Central Arizona Project Bill. Um, in 1965, they had hearings in the House Committee again, their first Washington-based hearings. And at that time, environmental groups started to come into those hearings to oppose the construction of bridge and Marble Canyon dams, which they were vigorously opposed to as destroying the Grand Canyon and, and uh, were uh, pretty adamant in their opposition. Probably the most uh, dynamic testimony was provided by Dave Brower, who was the president at that time, or executive director, I guess, of the Sierra Club. Tall, slender, dramatic-looking guy with white hair, but quite young-looking. And the attendance at that committee was just 100 percent. Everybody came in to see Dave Brower speak, and he made one of his typical, very dramatic statements before the committee in opposition to it. Everybody else testified, Department of Interior, uh, the Californians, uh, of course the Arizonans again, uh, and that kind of set the stage for some serious negotiations to look at a possible compromise between Arizona and California. It, uh, <coughs> I, this is probably obvious, but California's support for the CAP funding legislation was critical? Yes, because Arizona at that time had three House members, I believe. California had 38. We also had some fairly senior people in Congress, although John Rhodes was very senior himself. And uh, there was, a, I think, a strong feeling among the Arizonans that they could not pass a bill over California's really serious objection. And Nevada was pretty much, an, uh, this is a question, was pretty much a non-factor because they had such a small delegation? That's right. I think they had one member at that time, and they did not play a really large role other than to say, we want to protect our interest in this, and 
they had an allocation of 300,000 acre feet of water out of the Colorado River, the main stem from the lower basin. So uh, they did participate in the negotiations, but were never uh, uh, a really important factor in those negotiations. Um, the <clears throat> Upper Basin states at that time also came in to uh, raise their objections and talk about the possible impact on the lower basin, I mean on the upper basin. They wanted to make sure that their interests were protected under the Colorado River Compact and probably two principal people, Felix Sparks from Colorado and Ivo Goslin, who was the executive director of the Upper Basin Commission, which had been established when they did the Colorado River Storage Project back in the 50s, uh, joined the negotiations and took a fairly strong approach in support of a regional plan that was going to bring additional water to the Colorado while still making sure that their interests were protected as far as maintaining their water supply in the upper basin. Okay. And the upper basin consists of four states? Correct. Um, it's New Mexico, Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah. There is a tiny chunk of Arizona that's above, gets its water above Lee's Ferry, but I mean, not enough to, you know, poke in your eye hardly. Well, it's 50,000 acre feet. Yes, recall. yes, that, it's becoming more and more right. valuable nowadays. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> uh, also, at that time, because of this much grander Pacific Southwest water plan, representatives from the Columbia River Basin came in and started belly aching about our having our eyes on the Columbia River. And <coughs> that uh, just added more complications to the whole process. When you say our eyes, are you talking about California or Metropolitan or the Lower Basin or the region? or? Who is the pronoun? Who is the pronoun? Our eyes. I think probably all seven states of the Colorado River Basin. We knew that, you know, the, the Columbia was flowing at oh, in the neighborhood of a hundred million acre feet of water per year, and all we wanted to start with was five. I think we boosted that up to eight somewhere down the line, and. What's happened since then in the Columbia Basin has probably proved the Columbia Basin guys right, but we thought it was just a drop in the bucket that they wouldn't even miss it. So Oregon and the state of Washington came in and did some very serious objecting to the plan. And they didn't really care as long as we got the Columbia River off the table. Well, uh, at the end of those hearings in the House in 1965, the first coalition started to develop between Arizona, California, and the state of Colorado. The upper basin, the other upper basin states still were nervous about the whole thing and New Mexico was doing some of its own negotiating over the portion of the Gila River that arises in the state of New Mexico. But uh, Felix Sparks, whom we call Larry, who was the spokesman for the state of Colorado, uh, and the Arizonans and the Californians started to try and do some negotiating and come up with an acceptable plan that could be passed. Well, uh, 
I think probably one of our biggest problems was the Arizonans still deep distrust of California. Uh, Mike Ely was a lightning rod. He started to work on these projects when he was still representing the Salt River Project. They felt that uh, uh, he had betrayed them. Uh, there were some, there were some serious credibility issues, but on the other hand, it just had to go forward. Joe Jensen at MWD had started to make some personal contacts in the state of Arizona. A guy by the name of Rich Johnson at that time was executive secretary of the Arizona Interstate Stream Commission, who was basically their Colorado River Board in Arizona. They held discussions, they actually held some meetings. Uh, Jensen, as long as the priority for California was in there, was willing to negotiate and support their project. I obviously did not sit in on any of those meetings. Those were all held out here in California or in Arizona. But I usually got pretty good reports, and I basically reported directly to Jensen, uh, even though I was working for the general manager. But Jensen ran the show. Uh, and, and again, uh, we're restating, but uh, Joe Jensen was chairman of Metropolitan's board of directors. Correct. Yes. Uh, we didn't. We we started to get some accommodation, but in 1965 we were unable to put together a complete deal. In 1966, when Congress reconvened, and I forget when they adjourned, but Congress used to adjourn in late September, early October, and everything kind of went off the shelf for a while, at least as far as dealings in Washington, D.C. were concerned. So, because of the fight over the uh, Columbia River with Washington and Oregon, they decided to drop the big ditch out. They were going to continue to explore to find other water resources, but uh, the burden shifted to telling the feds that the Mexican Water Treaty obligation, which is a million and a half acre feet uh, treaty that was adopted in 1944, uh, that obligation was going to become a national obligation. And the United States had the responsibility of finding the water to meet those treaty needs. With that, the seven basin states of the Colorado River Basin finally reached an agreement on a common bill, which they felt would, we would be in a, a position to move forward with. The House conducted hearings again. Uh, the environmentalists again came in and attacked Bridge and Marble Canyon dams, which were still in draft legislation. And at that time, the Arizonans were still fighting for that because they needed the power subsidy to build their project, finance it. Do you recall offhand geogra uh, geographically where those two dams were to be built, roughly? Um, one just above and one just below Grand Canyon, above Hoover Dam, uh, above Lake Mead. I'm, 
I don't even recall which was which now. I think Bridge Canyon Dam was the one closest to Lake Mead, and Marble Canyon Dam was the one that was farther up the river. Okay, so, so one, one would have been in between uh, Lake Powell and Lake Mead somewhere. Both would have been. Oh, both would have been. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. They were power dams. There was no idea that they were going to uh, maintain a large enough pool to be significant for water storage. All they were going to do was just <coughs> run the river through them and grind out the kilowatts and, and sell them. Uh, after those hearings, uh, the House Committee actually reported a bill, which means they took action on a bill, and put it in a position where they could take it to uh, the House floor for a vote. But there were some more squabbles, and so uh, we got the Rules Committee to refuse to grant a rule which is necessary for a major House bill to go to the floor of the House. A rule is basically establishing the procedure uh, for the debate on the House floor. California had two members of the House Rules Committee, which was a very conservative, uh, kind of uh, august committee chaired by an old goat from Virginia by the name of Howard Smith, whose view when he did not like a bill was uh, to go out to his chicken ranch in Virginia and disappear. And uh, if the chairman wasn't there, the committee couldn't call a hearing. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, in 1966, which was the end of the next Congress, I believe that would be the 89th Congress, uh, decided to uh, just shut down and wait until the next Congress started in 1967, which would be, the, what's that, 90th Congress, 90th. I think, yes, if I can add right. Following the shutdown of the legislation, the Arizonans got really angry again. And there was a really a strong swell within the state of Arizona to build their own project. And there was uh, money appropriated to, within the Arizona legislature to start the studies to build their own project. Without federal funding? Without federal funding, but still relying on Marble and Bridge Canyon dams to be the cash registers to help support the project. So negotiations fell apart uh, pretty badly in the, the latter part of 66. In 1967, with the new Congress, and a really key person that I've failed to mention so far is the chairman of the full House Interior and Insular Affairs Committee, Wayne Aspinall, who was from uh, the West Slope in Colorado, and a powerful person, and in those days there was not the democracy in the committees that there is today. The chairman ran it lock, stock, and barrel. Hired all the staff, uh, set the agenda, told people what they could do and what they couldn't do. About the only thing that he would let the subcommittees do was hold hearings on legislation before the committee, and that was basically it. Um, Aspinall and uh, introduced his own version of the bill and 
joined with the Arizonans. Uh, they had dropped the concept of Marble Canyon or Marble Canyon Dam and had just left Bridge Canyon Dam in as a cash register, but had renamed it Wallapai Dam uh, to apparently try and hide it basically from the environmentalists, which wasn't really uh, very successful. Uh, because of the problem with the dams and the fear of the strength of the environmentalists even back in the 60s, uh, they held new hearings in the spring of 67. And at that time, Stuart Udall, Secretary of Interior, came up with the concept of doing away with both dams in the bill and buying into a non-federally owned power plant that was proposed for Page, Arizona. And it is in operation today. Uh, and. The feds have a piece of it, and it is used for the Central Arizona project. On the Senate side, a Senate bill was passed, uh, basically a, a, uh, an Arizona project bill, and uh, the Californians, Arizonans, and the Upper Basin representatives started to get into additional squabbles. Uh, okay. Pat, Pat Browns uh, had continued during all of this time to send representatives from Sacramento to try and see if he could solve the fight. They were Wes Steiner from the Department of Water Resources, who later became Director of Water Resources for the state of Arizona, and Abbott Goldberg, who was uh, a lawyer for the state of California, and uh, actually a brilliant guy and knew the water business inside out and backwards. <coughs> now, this is an aside, Bob, but since you're at the right time frame, and you just mentioned Pat Brown, and I don't mean to get you into any depth on this, but Pat Brown was also struggling with the State Water Project at about this same time, was he not? Um, on the construction of it, because the State Water Project was approved by the voters in 1960, and construction was starting on the State Water Project. There were plenty of problems. Uh, so water was on his mind almost all of the time, I guess. You probably recall Pat Brown had two major issues, higher education and water when he came into office. And uh, he carried out both of them. He was, I think, a quite successful governor of California. Uh, West Steiner and Abbott Goldberg were doing uh, a lot of personal work with Senator Hayden and trying to help uh, compromise all of these issues uh, between California and Arizona. Uh, Senator Kiko finally decided that these guys are really interfering with my ability to work uh, with both Southern and <clears throat> all of California on these, called up Pat Brown and asked Pat Brown to yank them out of Washington, which Pat Brown did. Uh, Mike Ely <clears throat> was still a lightning rod. There was still a lot of antagonism over him. And um, finally, the Colorado River Board started to put other people into Washington uh, to try and help with the negotiations. 
but of course Ely still represented the Colorado River Board people and uh, so he continued to play a role. <coughs> you want to take a break? Or you okay? Yeah, I'd like to take a break and have a little water or something. After a short break, and uh, we were talking about uh, Arizona, California issues and uh, Upper Basin getting involved and uh, things like that. Yeah, and I think I had gotten to the start of 1968 and uh, that was our final agreement with Arizona and we had a joint bill with Arizona and with the state of Colorado and it included the permanent 4.4 priority for California, which had never wavered in our uh, negotiating position on the whole thing. Um, we did make, uh, as a part of it, the Mexican Water Treaty a national obligation, which we discussed a few minutes ago. And the bill went to the Rules Committee and approved for floor action and the bill passed in the House on the House floor uh, in May of 68. Uh, Senator uh, Hayden uh, had earlier passed his bill and the agreement was that when the differing bills went to conference that Hayden would accept the bill that the Californians had negotiated with the House members uh, from Arizona. So that kind of ends the saga of the Central Arizona Project legislation which became known as the Lower Colorado River Basin Project Act it included lots of, of uh, compromises with the upper basin with regard to the operation of the dams on the river. And by the way, this did not include either Bridge or Marble Canyon dams. It included the federal purchase of some capacity in the Page, Arizona power plant. And went to the White House and the President signed it, I believe, in September of 1968 in a, one of LBJ's typical massive signing ceremonies where everybody got a pen and, and got to shake the President's hand, including riffraff like me. <laughs> and. Uh, and so, the, the resolution of the Gila water, Gila, by the way, is G-I-L-A. What was the resolution of the Gila water with respect to uh, Arizona's claim that it should not be counted? The resolution was that we get a 4.4 priority in California over diversions for the Central Arizona project itself. So if the river supply is below seven and a half million acre feet per year. Before any shortages are taken from California or Nevada, uh, the Central Arizona project is reduced until it's all gone. And that project is about a million point two acre feet a year. We had a whale of a party, as you might expect. Uh, we were all madly in love with each other and hugging, and, and uh, it was quite a celebration. And the Arizonans got their project, which is up and running today. Uh, interestingly, and uh, jumping ahead a little bit, uh, 
I continued to work for Metropolitan until 1980 uh, when I resigned and took on Metropolitan as a single client or as one of my clients in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Central Arizona Water Conservation District, which runs the Central Arizona Project, hired me as their lobbyist in Washington. So they may not have liked some of the other Californians, but they got along pretty well with me. So you were working for Central Arizona Water Conservancy District and Metropolitan Water District simultaneously as a yes, consultant? Yes, for a few years, yes. Uh, we finally got back into some scraps with Arizona, and so I had to get rid of the Arizonans' uh, conflict of interest problem. So. Uh, the, the players in that whole thing remained pretty stable throughout the entire period. From the federal government, we had Stuart Udall and Floyd Dominey, who was Commissioner of Reclamation. Floyd Dominey was uh, beholden to Carl Hayden and worked very hard on this project. And he was probably the most dynamic, uh, hardest working commissioner that I've known in you know the almost 40 years that I've worked in Washington, D.C very able guy. Uh, could make people pretty mad, but uh, he was tough and ornery and nobody messed with him. Um, I kind of indicated some of the Californians uh, on the House side are, in addition to Biz Johnson, uh, who was of course a Northern Californian, uh, we had two Southern Californians, Craig Hosmer from Long Beach and Chet Hollifield from Norwalk, uh, who kind of led the California group and were very good. Uh, for the Upper Basin guys, they had Wayne Aspinall and they didn't need much more. Very powerful guy. And uh, then among the Arizonans, I just jotted down a couple of names. I've mentioned Rich Johnson before, who was the executive director of the Arizona Interstate Stream Commission. They borrowed people from all over the state. Um, one of the most important was Ted Riggins, who was a lawyer in practice in Phoenix and did a lot of work for the Salt River Project. Uh, and he was one of their chief negotiators. There was an engineer for the Interstate Stream Commission by the name of Bill Gookin, uh, who worked primarily with Carl Hayden, but uh, was very good. Uh, engineer for the state of New Mexico was a guy by the name of Steve Reynolds, who was as ornery and as tough as anybody in this whole crowd, and held up the Central Arizona Project for a while, arguing over water supply on the Gila, which starts in New Mexico. And as a part of the compromise, there's a provision for the construction of Hooker Dam, which is in New Mexico and presumably would store some water. Hooker has never been built. So, um, talk about a couple of other issues. Uh, in the late 60s, the uh, Welton Mohawk Irrigation District, together with the Bureau of Reclamation, started to run into some serious groundwater salinity problems in uh, the Welton Mohawk groundwater field. The only way to resolve it was pump out these saline waters and just dump additional water. And they took their diversions uh, primarily from the Gila, but also were a part of uh, the uh, project down in the Yuma area, in the Yuma project. Uh, the 
effluent that they were dumping from their pumping of the groundwater, which they put back in the Colorado above the border, was really foul stuff. And the salinity in Mexico water deliveries rose from uh, oh, probably around 800 parts, maybe a little bit less, up to 1,400 and 1,500. And the farmers in the Mexicali Valley started to have serious crop problems uh, with this highly saline water. When you say parts, you're talking parts per million? Yes, yes. And so uh, this turned into a continuing fight and finally ended up in uh, 1972 with a meeting between President Nixon and President Echeverria of Mexico on this issue. And it was a major issue uh, for the Mexican government. Nixon committed to Echeverria that they would find a solution to that problem. He appointed Herbert Brownell as his special representative to uh, try and come up with some solutions. So the 1944 treaty between the United States and Mexico addressed quantity, but it did not address quality. Is that correct? That's correct. And we continued to maintain that when I say we, I mean the seven states, of the Colorado River Basin. And the Mexican says, that's stupid. You can't deliver us stuff that we can't use. So that was kind of the bone of contention. Uh, also at the time that the Mexican Water Treaty was negotiated back in the early 40s, the State Department had created something called the Committee of 14, which was two reps from each of the seven basin states appointed by that state's governor. That had kind of vanished into obscurity, but at this time the Committee of 14 was reconstituted to work with Brownell. And kind of paralleling those negotiations, uh, Myron Holbert, who was then at the Colorado River Board as executive secretary or whatever the title was at the time, did a study on the impact of salinity within Southern California, uh, both urban impacts and agricultural impacts and managed to demonstrate that salinity in the Colorado uh, for the area above the border was also becoming a problem, basically in the lower basin. Um, the State Department and Brownell felt that their charge was just to resolve the problem with Mexico. But the seven basin states came up with a program <coughs> to help reduce the salinity uh, above the border. And at the time when uh, they were, when the State Department was getting ready to put together an authorization bill for uh, the Mexican problem, seven basin states came in and said, we're going to tack our own bill on creating a Colorado River Salinity Control Program uh, for areas within the United States. For the record, water that is about uh, 300 parts per million in total dissolved solids is characterized as pretty good water. Water that is, say, 700 parts per million total dissolved solids, and, and we say TDS, is getting to the edge of not being very good water. And so the delivery of water to Mexico that exceeded 1,100 parts per water 
uh, was a, a problem. Yes, it was for him, and actually it was up to 1,400 parts for a while. And, uh, the, uh, the resolution of it was an agreement that we would deliver water to Mexico at the international boundary below Imperial Dam at not to exceed 130 parts per million uh, TDS over what was delivered to Imperial Irrigation District at uh, the All-American Canal. The waste flows from the Welton Mohawk Irrigation District were going to be channeled through a separate drain that ran to Santa Clara Slough uh, on the Colorado uh, a number of miles down into Mexico and then the United States was going to build the Yuma desalting plant to clean up the Welton Mohawk flows so they should could go back into the mainstream of the river because the, the uh, drainage ditch to Santa Clara Slough did not go into the main stem of the Colorado. Those drainage flows could not be counted as a part of Mexico's entitlement to water under their million and a half acre feet uh, entitlement that they had under the treaty. So uh, the humid desalting plant was clean up that water and then dump it back into the main stem of the river so that uh, we could be credited for those flows. The Seven Basin States added a Title II to the uh, State Department's legislation, uh, which established a program through the Bureau of Reclamation to uh, build facilities uh, primarily in the upper basin of the Colorado to reduce inflow of saline waters into the Colorado. The The upper basin, primarily in Colorado and in Utah, are geologic time seabeds. And they have uh, this, what they call Mancus Shale, which is essentially just mud and salt mixed together, which are now on the top of the mountains from whatever cataclysmic event happened to uh, you know, a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, every time water flows through that area, it picks up the salts off of these uh, old Mancus shale. So they figured that there were probably, uh, well, they wanted to do a number of things. First of all, there's some salt springs, just good old fashioned springs that popped up in Colorado and were dumping absolutely terrible salty water into the Colorado River. Uh, there were a lot of open irrigation ditches uh, through both uh, Utah and Colorado that the farmers used to get the irrigation water. This caused seepage to go into this Mancus Shale and then eventually drain into the Colorado. Uh, there were also some industrial uses, <coughs> urban uses, there's not much industry in the, in the Colorado River Basin up in the upper basin. Um, so it was a kind of a three-pronged approach. One, let's get rid of these salt springs. Two, let's uh, resolve the irrigation ditch problem, and three, let's work with the communities up there, you know, whether it's Glenwood Springs or, or 
some of those other communities and reduce their discharge of salt flows uh, into the Colorado. And that became the so-called Title II part of the Colorado River Salinity Bill, and it's a program that is still going today. Uh, there were big negotiations on how to finance it. Uh, we agreed to cost share with the federal government. Uh, I think we started out at paying for 25 percent of the cost of these facilities. We is the basin states? Yes. And the Bureau of Reclamation was to go up and build projects. They were line the irrigation ditches with concrete uh, or put in pipe, uh, do the same thing with the small communities. Uh, and try and either cap the salt springs or in some cases uh, um, take the discharge from the spring and pump it back deep underground. And uh, that program, uh, the, the upper basin, the, the lower basin states put up 85 percent of the money through their cost sharing program. And the upper basin states put up 15 percent. Wait a minute, you just used the upper basin twice. The lower basin states agreed to put up 85 percent of the cost. <laughs> the upper basin, 15 percent. And it was one of those typical negotiations. I mean, it, you know, neither one makes much sense, but uh, I mean, the numbers don't. But that's where we came out. Um, so the, that program was undertaken uh, in, oh, uh, in the early 80s. It also became apparent that we needed a program to work directly with farmers because the amount of water they were putting on their land was causing the same seepage problem as the canals were. So we included the Department of Agriculture, which has extensive on-farm uh, improvement programs to include what we call the on-farm program, which is substantial improvement of irrigation practices. Uh, you, know, you know, farmers up there that had old water rights, they didn't care how much water they put on the land, they just wanted the, the crop to grow. <coughs> These programs would help the farmers put in sprinkler irrigation, uh, do better irrigation. <coughs> excuse me, management and things of that character. Uh, that program is still going today. Uh, but that was by amendment, I guess, to a farm bill uh, back in the early 80s. And it has been a quite successful program, and it's been a very popular program with farmers because nothing they like better than somebody coming in and paying, you know, 60, 70 percent of uh, installing a whole new irrigation system on their property, so it uh, was well liked. And that has been primarily in uh, the state of Utah. Some work also in the state of Wyoming where the, the Colorado gets its start. Um, we've continued to have problems with that program when they did a farm bill six years ago, um, <clears throat> they changed how the money was appropriated for the USDA salinity control program and made it an administrative determination rather than uh, one that Congress approved as a line item in its appropriation bill. We've not resolved that problem yet. 
during this past farm bill, we tried to change it back so that it became a part of of uh, the congressional appropriation process. <coughs> it now comes out of a major program called uh, Equip Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which is a massive program for all kinds of environmental issues for farmers, uh, and we got stuck in there. Uh, the problem was that the various state sections of the Department of Agriculture pass out. They didn't think much. first year after the last farm bill by about 1914 <clears throat> we went down struggling with that we've been trying to do it administratively uh, take that piece out of the farm bill appropriation The Colorado. have an executive director and they meet quarterly and go over reports. The next major issue that I was involved in, and in 1971, And we had very little going on in Washington, D.C. Not to work on legislation canal. But I also continued to maintain the Washington, D.C. office, which I've been going on. That lasted until... This is... Being general counsel, in fact, uh, future general. The other was uh, Ron Gastelum. Um, but I moved. Um, I really didn't enjoy at the end uh, the general counsel's job that much, and I had an opportunity to go back and and. Uh, start this lobbying job again in Washington, D.C. MWD had maintained an office in Washington. Uh, but, in fact, it was Ron Gastelum who took it over in the mid-70s, and he finally quit and went to Sacramento to uh, work for a law firm. So I went back and took it over on a contract basis. So that's kind of the, 
the history of my personal involvement. Um, talk a little bit about the Hoover Power Act. In uh, the late 70s, uh, while Lawton was general manager, very preliminary negotiations started on renewing of the Hoover Power contracts. The Hoover Power contracts, which MWD had executed back in the 30s. No, we're, I just want to make sure we had tape here. Oh. You're working. Go ahead. Uh, that would be embarrassing to have you sit here and talk for about a half an hour. And no tape. <laughs> no tape. Okay. You got another five minutes or yeah, so? Yeah, we're good. Uh, um, the Hoover Power contracts are due to expire in 1987. And we figured it probably about a 10-year lead time to get them renegotiated and, and be ready to renew them in 1987. Um, we knew that Arizona and Nevada, who collectively only had uh, a very small percentage of the Hoover power output. I think each of them had about 15 percent. Uh, we're going to come in and demand a third each, so there would be one third, one third, one third for the three states of the total generation at, at Hoover. Uh, we retained. Uh, an electrical engineer from Sacramento by the name of Lloyd Harvico, who worked for an outfit called RMI. In fact, it was his outfit. <laughs> and uh, as a part of the fights we were having, because we didn't want to lose any of our uh, power out of Hoover Dam, uh, Lloyd. I believe was the one who came up with the idea of, well, let's increase the output of Hoover. Uh, as I recall, the output at Hoover was about 1,300 megawatts. Lloyd says, we can rewind those units. There's enough water. We can get it up to 1,900 megawatts. And that way we can split it and keep everybody happy. Uh, we also had a lot of other people who were really interested in sticking their hand into the power generation there. And one of the most serious was San Diego Gas and Electric. And uh, they were using their congressional delegation from San Diego County to try and uh, push their way in. We finally managed to convince them that it was not going to work we felt that we had the votes to block them from doing it. However, interestingly, in uh, Southern California Edison, who was one of the original uh, power allities at Hoover Dam from the 30s, uh, retained its role. And it was basically on the idea that the original contracts permitted renewal so Edison should have a right to renew. So they are the only <coughs> investor-owned utility that has a power right to Hoover Dam. Um, the, the logic behind that is that they helped pay for the dam in the first place. Correct. And, okay. Yeah, when the, when the project was first put together, uh, the only way that they would get started on the dam was that MWD, LA Water and Power, and Edison guaranteed uh, to buy all of the power from Hoover Dam and, in effect, repay it. Hoover Dam is not repaid through water revenues, it's repaid through uh, power revenues. Uh, MWD got into some serious fights with LA Water and Power. 
MWD's contract provided that its power was available for pumping into and through the Colorado River Aqueduct. So LA Water and Power said, okay, that's all you can use your power for. Uh, and any it's left over, we're going to get. Well, that was quite a fight and eventually got put to bed. Uh, <coughs> So after these long negotiations in Arizona and Nevada and California kind of kissed the book uh, in order to put the legislation together to renew it because it took authorization, of course, to upgrade the plant and provide for the payment schedules and everything on how that was to be done. We were ready to take the bill to the floor in the House. and. Tom Graff from the Environmental Defense Fund, whose typical approach to Southern California water problems is make the urban areas pay more for their water, because uh, that will increase conservation, uh, sponsored, or not sponsored, but got George Miller and Barbara Boxer, who was then a member of the House, and George Miller was a representative from Contra Costa County in, in uh, the Bay Area, I guess you could say, uh, to sponsor a bill to put the power, all of the power at Hoover Dam up for auction. Disregard our contracts completely. Um, that created quite a dust up, but they got a lot of sympathy and we beat back that amendment in <coughs> excuse me, in the House by only forty votes. So it was a tough fight in the House. But we won, the bill went over to the Senate. In the Senate there was a senator from Ohio, a strong environmentalist by the name of Howard Metzenbaum. And <clears throat> Howard Metzenbaum filibustered the Hoover Power Plant bill in the Senate. And <clears throat> under Senate rules, it takes 60 votes to block off a filibuster. The so-called cloture vote uh, sets up a schedule for debate of only 30 more hours after uh, cloture is approved. That was a pretty exciting time because we just barely made it. We got 60 votes on the Senate floor, which was just enough to shut Metzenbaum up. And after we got cloture, he gave up, uh, but he was carrying the the Miller-Boxer Amendment uh, in the Senate. And uh, so the bill was finally passed and sent on to the President. In the negotiations on the Hoover Power Plant bill, two interesting issues were brought up. Uh, Bob Broadbent, who had been uh, a county commissioner from Clark County, Nevada, was appointed Commissioner of Reclamation in, when Reagan came in in 1981, I guess it was. Broadbent was a tough, savvy, able commissioner. And he said, well, there are two things that Nevada wants out of this in addition to uh, the uh, one-third of the power. One is we want a visitor center at Hoover Dam and the second is we want the power revenues to pay for a bridge from Nevada to Arizona at the dam site. And these are replacements because those things did exist at the time. There was a visitor center. Not much of one, but there was one. Yeah. And, and of course there is a bridge that directly goes over Hoover Dam. Yeah, it's hardly a bridge. It's just the top of the dam. Right. Two-lane road built for cars back in 
32 or 33, something like that. Uh, so we got into some heavy negotiations. Broadbent was a protege of Paul Laxalt, who was a senator from Nevada and probably the senator closest to uh, Ronald Reagan. So lots of power there. So we decided we would negotiate with Broadbent and we said, okay, uh, we'll build a visitor center, but no bridge. Uh, <laughs> hindsight has changed that somewhat. <laughs> we probably could have built the bridge cheaper, cheaper. than the visitor <laughs> center, but who knew at the time that you could spend $140 million on a visitor center? Uh, but regardless, uh, they're still trying to get that bridge built, but they're looking for other money for it nowadays. Uh, the, the visitor center uh, was, was quite a project, and uh, we finally worked out something with the Bureau of Reclamation where they charge high enough fees for people to go into the dam. Uh, so there were actually being protected pretty well on the costs of the visitor center. Although I don't know what's happened since 9-11 uh, and the visitor crowd has slowed down somewhat. Yeah. But, but the issue, again, just for the record, Bob, the issue was that the, the visitor center was subjected to serious cost overruns and the repayment uh, of the funds used to build the visitor center were laid at the door of the power users. Correct. Fair, okay. Absolutely, yeah. And it was, uh, and uh, if I recall, I think the the estimated cost of the visitor center at the time we were in these negotiations was about forty million dollars, and the cost of the bridge was very close to a hundred million dollars. So we thought, well, okay, we'll take the cheapest <laughs> one because we knew we had to take something. <laughs> uh, who knows? Um, I guess one other issue that uh, I wanted to talk about was um, the All-American Canal Lining Bill. Okay, and, and having said that, let me stop the camera and I'll put in a new tape here just so we don't run out in the middle. Let and me get some more water and have a cigarette. Now. All right. 